Welcome to our fourth CoverPoint review of the year. We'll be looking mainly at the English summer, but also bringing you some of the best of the international action we've seen over the last 12 months. Some might say that 1997 was a disaster for English cricket. Trounced by the Aussies, the New Deal promised by Ian McLaurin, kiboshed by the counties, and we couldn't even win our own championship. Or you could take the view that the England side showed it was heading in the right direction, that there's not much wrong with English cricket as it's been for most of the last hundred years, and that Glamorgan's narrow victory over Kent on the last day of the season proves that the championship is both vibrant and competitive. Well, more of that later, but first let's wind the tape back to the start of the summer. The Australians had arrived and the first major battle was for the Texaco Trophy. In 1993, they'd waltzed through and won it 3-0. How would they fare in 1997? Well, Mark Pugach was there to find out. Six wickets, six wickets and six wickets read the scoreline and in England's favour. Sometimes results can be misleading, but not in this case. England played superbly and Australia were, dare we say it, outclassed. In the field, England sparkled. They affected six run-outs, four with direct hits, and all the victims were top-order batsmen. In the second match at the Oval, the comical run-out of a beleaguered Mark Taylor said a lot about the lack of harmony in the Australian camp. He didn't play in the third game. England had followed up 1996's successful practice of picking a specialist one-day squad, and the call-up of both Adam Holyoke and, to the surprise of many, his 19-year-old brother Ben paid off in style. Elder brother Adam had the satisfaction of hitting the winning runs in all three matches, scored two unbeaten half-centuries and bowled tidily and effectively at the death. His most important contribution was in the crucial win at Headingley in the opening match. Coming in at 40 for four, with the target of 171 looking far from straightforward, he and his Surrey colleague Graham Thorpe knocked off the remaining 135 runs without further loss. Thorpe's innings was the best of the series by either side, and he was particularly severe on Shane Warne. Whereas England's spinner Robert Croft had bowled his turnovers for only 16 runs, Warne went for 46 from his. Welcome 50 for England, that is. But that's cut away beautifully. Well, that was short, and it's hooked away. Six runs, only 50. Fine shot, Gillespie got fingertips on it. A noble effort to stop it, but it's obviously come out of the middle of the bat. That's a fine performance by Adam Bollier. England's win came with almost 10 overs to spare, with each batsman scoring seven boundaries. The winning runs came in style as Jason Gillespie, who like most of the Australian side looked short of practice, pitched short and Holyoke pulled disdainfully for six into the Western Terrace. The highest score of the series came from the England skipper. Mike Atherton's unbeaten 113 at the Oval in the second match was the bedrock for another successful run chase as England took an unassailable lead in the series. Atherton's style of play has long been criticised as unsuitable for one-day cricket, but it wasn't long ago that he was player of the series against the West Indies. In fact, prior to this series, he averaged over 45 in the Texaco Trophy and he clearly relishes the challenge at home where, until next season, the ball is still red. Here, with a target of 250, he was at his tenacious best, playing second fiddle at first to Alex Stewart and then to Hollyoke, but nevertheless managing to score and a run a ball for the second half of the innings. That was a good length ball, looked as though it was at middle stump, and Atherton has smashed it away over mid wicket. Slower ball. This has been a good over for England, that's guided away for two more. Two more that bring 100 up for Michael Atherton. Well, Australia's captain might be struggling. England's captain is in fine form. That's been a nicely paced innings for him. 100 out of 210 so far. When the winning runs came with successive boundaries to Hollyoak, 10 balls still remained, and Atherton was clearly delighted to have masterminded such an emphatic victory. 
Holyoke and Atherton have seen England through. That is a terrific victory to follow on the one at Headingley. And England have won this Texaco series. Australia's batting improved throughout the series, but it never knitted as a unit. Michael Bevan top scored in the first two games, and his 108 not out of the oval was a classy innings. Bevan's one-day record is dazzling. He averages over 56, but he was the only Australian to produce his best form in the series. As ever, he was particularly strong square of the wicket, although his power through extra cover and mid-wicket is the most eye-catching feature of his play. But for all of Bevan's endeavour, the Australian innings was more notable for its four runouts, as England contained Australia on a good pitch. Have to be quick here. Oh, that is close. Come on, come on! Trouble here. Philip oh. Defoe is in brilliantly. Come on, come on. Well, it's a direct hit. Only Mark Waugh of Australia's regular test batsman made a significant impact on the series. His 95 in the last match at Lords was typically That's elegant, containing 12 fours, with Chris Silverwood in particular being punished for a wayward spell with the new ball in his only game of the series. But Silverwood's Yorkshire teammate Darren Goff was a different matter altogether. In each game, he was England's most threatening bowler, and his return of 5 for 44 at Lord's was just reward for a fine series. That's got him. Matthew Elliott's gone. Nice, comfortable catch at second slip. Oh, no doubt about that. That's another good catch. That came at a tremendous rate of knots to Nick Knight. The other England bowler to pose problems throughout the series was Mark Elam. He produced the catch of the series to dismiss Slater off his own bowling at Leeds and along with Hollyoak proved the value of a tight line and varied pace. England had already won the series by the time they went to Lords, but they were determined not to allow Australia to recover any lost ground. That they succeeded was largely down to a phenomenal debut from the 19-year-old Ben Hollyoak. Chosen to bat at number three in the pinch-hitting role he'd been given at Surrey, he smashed 63 runs from just 48 balls, including 11 fours and a mighty swept six off Shane Warne. Gillespie finally had Hollyoak caught a gully, but the memory of his innings will live long in the minds of those who saw it. There were 50s too for Stewart and John Crawley, and an unbeaten 45 from Thorpe, which allowed the elder Hollyoak to push the winning run once again, his collection of stumps growing by the day. For Australia, it was a dismal start to an important tour. For England, it was the start of the season they needed, and a vital boost before what would doubtless be a very long and testing summer. Heady stuff, but even the most fervent optimist would realise that the Test Series could be a far sterner test for England. After all, the Australians had only just beaten the West Indies in the previous few months. You might think it was all standard stuff. Ambrose and Walsh virtually unplayable, opposition batsmen looking shell-shocked, and Lara smashing the ball to all parts. Except that this was the fifth test, and the Australians had already won the series in convincing style. When Ian Healy walked the wicket in the first test at Brisbane, Australia were 196 for five. When the innings closed, they were 479 all out, and Healy had scored an invaluable 161 not out. Hooper and Chanderpaul showed some resistance, but a lead of 200 was critical. And despite 100 in the second innings from showing Campbell, Australia ran out comfortable winners. Healy's batting was again crucial in the next test at Sydney, this time in conjunction with Greg Blewett. But Campbell, Chanderpaul and Bishop ensured that honours were even on first innings. Matthew Elliott and Mark Waugh were steering the home side to a strong position when a collision forced Elliott out of the series, but Bevan, Blewett and Healy pressed on to enable a declaration. West Indies looked to be heading for the safety of a draw, but when Warren dismissed Chanderpaul, they then collapsed abjectly to give Australia a 2-0 lead. Melbourne was all about Kirtley Ambrose and Glenn McGrath, who dominated a low-scoring match. 
Lewitt, Healy and Steve Waugh were the only contributors as Ambrose, with 5 for 55, restricted Australia to 219 all out. Chandler Paul, Adams and Junior Murray gave the visitors a precious 36 run lead, whilst McGrath matched Ambrose's figures almost exactly. But only Steve Waugh passed 20 as Australia were blown away for 122 in their second innings. Ambrose finishing with match figures of 9 for 72 as Australia lasted just 45 overs. McGrath snatched three wickets, including that of Lara, for the fourth time in the last four innings at a cost of just seven runs, to finish with match figures of 8 for 91, before West Indies passed the modest target to bring the series back to 2-1. Adelaide was therefore a must win for them, but he wouldn't have guessed it from the way they batted, Warren and Bevan benefiting from some awful shots as they made just 130. Australia put that into perspective with a reply of 517. Matthew Hayden, Mark Waugh, Blewett and Bevan taking advantage of Ambrose's absence through injury. Despite some resistance from Hooper and Lara, the outcome was never in doubt. And with Michael Bevan collecting what will surely be career best match figures of 10 for 113, Australia clinched the series by inflicting the third largest defeat ever on the West Indies by an innings and 183 runs. The Oz is in very impressive form there, but now it's time to go back to our domestic season, the Benson Hedges Cup and Mark Pugach. If the Texaco Trophy heralded the arrival of Ben Holyoke on the international stage, the Benson and Hedges Cup was to provide further glories for him on the domestic front. But things didn't start so well for the Surrey youngster when Kent's Mark Elam swung him high over long on for six to hand Surrey a last ball defeat in the first group match of the season. Still, Surrey squeezed through to the quarterfinals despite that early loss, and in fact it was Lancashire who were the most unexpected casualties of the zonal matches. Darren Goff and Chris Silverwood combined for Yorkshire to earn welcome revenge for 1996 over their Roses rivals in the opening game. Richard Blakey's diving catch to dismiss Warren Hegg was the highlight of a professional display in the field that brought Yorkshire home by 49 runs. That's it. End of the game. Yorkshire have won a memorable victory here at uh, Old Trafford. That loss and another to Derbyshire cost Lancashire a place in the quarter-finals and their crown after two years as holders. Surrey faced Essex in their quarter-final at Chelmsford and seemed in some trouble when Nasser Hussain climbed into Martin Bicknell, smashing two sixes over mid-wicket. Surrey and Bicknell fought back well, dismissing Hussain and Danny Law before the tale subsided. Adam Holyoke was in the thick of it in the field, taking wickets with his first and sixth balls, plus a stinging catch at gully off Chris Lewis. Brother Ben failed to emulate his heroics for England the previous weekend, falling LBW to Ashley Cowan for 17 from 10 balls. But a typically flamboyant innings of 71 in 78 balls from Ali Brown helped Surrey into the semi-finals. Kent's progress to the semi-final was unblemished, an abandoned game against Gloucestershire apart, but they had to work hard to beat Warwickshire in the quarter-final at Canterbury. Neil Smith smashed 125 from 119 balls for the visitors, and Warwickshire looked well placed with a score of 304 for eight from their 50 overs. But when Alan Donald failed to control the new ball and then broke down with a strained side, Kent cashed in. Matthew Walker led the reply perfectly with 117. And then Graham Cowdery supplied the finishing touches in his own uncomplicated way with an unbeaten 39 from 26 balls. Kent won with three balls to spare. Kent, a remarkable performance, chasing 305 to win this match and doing it with three balls to spare. Their semi-final opponents were Northhands, who'd beaten Yorkshire in the previous round. David Cable had been the inspiration in that game, taking five for 51 with the ball, including Darren Lehman, Anthony McGrath and Craig White in the space of four decisive balls in the 16th over. Not content with that, Cable then smashed two sixes and nine fours on his way to 67 from 59 balls, and Northants ran out winners with four overs in hand. Cable was unfit for the semi, but Northants began well. 
Walker and Matthew Fleming went early, Fleming to a rasping catch at point, and Kent never looked like repeating their high scoring of earlier rounds. Trevor Ward top scored with 78, and only a late flurry of improvisation from Steve Marsh got Kent past 200. North Hans was set an achievable run rate of 4.14 and over. But it was when North Hans batted that Capel's loss was most keenly felt. Dean Headley immediately bowled Russell Warren and then trapped Mal Loy plumb in front. A big shout here and he's gone. Kevin Curran was brilliantly caught at mid-off and facing a batting lineup patently short of experience, Kent never looked back. With athletic and often spectacular support from the fielders, both close to the wicket and in the outfield, the Kent bowlers ran through Northampton's middle order. Paul Strang took four wickets as the batsman swung vainly at his tight leg spin and then completed the 66-run triumph with a catch in the deep. It's in the air, it's out, it's caught at deep point. Full toss. At the Oval in the other semi-final, Surrey trounced Leicestershire in a completely one-sided contest. Alex Stewart and Graham Thorpe put on 158 for the third wicket, the boundary seeming to come whenever and wherever they wanted. And then Adam Holyoke blasted 63 from 40 balls, as Surrey posted a demanding total of 308. That's plenty, all in one go. Six runs. Taking Adam Hollyoak on to a very fine 55. But Surrey were, if possible, even more dominant with the ball. Martin That's Bicknell nice. and Chris Lewis sent back Darren Maddy, Neil Johnson, James Whitaker, and Aftab Habib in quick succession. And by the time the fielding restriction had gone, so had Leicester's chances. New signing Saklane Mushtaq was hardly required, as Surrey romped home by 130 runs. Paul Nixon was last out for 53, which saved his side from total embarrassment, but the Surrey players' thoughts had long since moved on to Lords and their first B&H final for 16 years. The final seemed to promise all that one day cricket enthusiasts could hope for. A match involving 15 internationals offered a feast of cricket and a truly competitive game. The Surrey bowlers struck gold early on. Two wickets in two balls accounting for the dangerous opening pair Walker and Fleming, though not without a little luck. And he's got that one as well. Well, two wickets in successive balls. Chris Lewis goes into orbit, but uh, Matthew Fleming is out. LBW. Alan Wells and Ward also went cheaply, but Nigel Long's confident driving stopped the Kent engine from stalling, and with Mark Elam, he restored some calm. Nicely timed, just a call of weights just to make sure the ball got past the fielder. And once it was passed, well, it runs down that hill pretty quickly. When Long fell to the offspin of Sack Lane for a well-made 42 from 65 balls, Elam and Cowdery carried Kent's hopes. But Chris Lewis returned to dismiss them both, and it was left to Marsh and Strang to get Kent past 200. That's good stroke, beautifully timed, and a struggle for the man down at third man. Such good timing. A run rate of 4.26 and over seemed unlikely to trouble a lineup boasting so many England batsmen. But Kent's previous success in defending low totals meant nothing was certain, especially with a wicket in the first over. Ben Holyoke walked to the middle with a string of disappointing scores behind him. His Texaco Trophy innings at the end of May, his only performance of note. True to form, he could have been out twice in the fifth over from the same delivery, but both catch and run out chances went down, followed swiftly by the bowler and the fielder themselves. Holyoke responded in the best possible way. Taking advantage of the early fielding restrictions, the 19 year old dazzled the crowd with a sparkling array of shots, and the Kent bowlers helped by bowling to his strengths pitching leg stump too often. He reached 50 in 48 minutes, keeping Surrey's scoring rate of more than five and over. Cracking shot. Ben Holyoke has got to 50. Steve Marsh rotated his bowlers intelligently, but his efforts somewhat resembled those of Raglan at the charge of the light brigade. The spin of Long and Strang did a little to staunch the bloodletting. 
Holyoke had taken Surrey from two for one to 161 for one, when an appointment with fate denied him within sight of his century. Still, the capacity crowd didn't begrudge him a couple of runs, and he was given a hero's welcome. But already the crowd is standing because they've had a one-all exhibition of stroke play. So refreshing to see a young man play so uncomplicated an in innings. It then fell to Alex Stewart, an unobtrusive foil to Holyoke's jewelled innings, to see Surrey home. His half-century, reached a few balls later, contained just three boundaries. But with Graham Thorpe, he established a stable partnership which secured victory with five overs to spare, Stewart 75 not out. Eight wickets the margin between Surrey and Kent. Stewart has finished up unbeaten and jubilant on 75. A jubilant crowd cheered as the England captain presented Ben Holyoke with his Man of the Match award, while his brother received the winner's check and, of course, the celebrated golden trophy. Quite a year for the Hollyoaks, wasn't it? Now, this time last autumn, England were about to set off on the gentlest tour possible, visiting Zimbabwe and New Zealand. But it was anything but a sinecure. For a start, the Zimbabweans were surprisingly competitive. The first session of the first test in Bulawayo summed up England's inconsistency, as indisciplined bowling allowed Zimbabwe to score over 100 before lunch. Andy Flower and Alistair Campbell saw the home side to 376, and leg spinner Paul Strang caused England to totter at 160 for four, before hundreds by Hussain and Crawley steered the visitors to a small lead. Phil Tufnell and Robert Croft turned the screws on Zimbabwe, but frequent rain breaks meant it was a race against time. Nick Knight and Alex Stewart went for the target of 205 off 35 overs, as though it was a one-day match, but without the benefit of one-day rules. And amidst high drama, the match finished as a draw with the scores level. Knight's down the track, he's got it out to deep cover, there's a man there. This two will bring the scores level. Andy Flowers got it, Darren Goff vainly goes for the third runs, the scores are level. But the match is drawn. England finished tantalisingly, one run short. England's poor batting on a damp pitch at Harare in the second test did nothing to stem the tide of criticism from seemingly every quarter. Slated in the press for adopting an ungracious, siege-like mentality, relations between the sides had deteriorated, and even Ian McLaurin, the new chairman of ECB, was forthright in his condemnation of what he saw. Darren Goff gained some consolation by taking his 50th test wicket in a return of 4 for 40, and he helped to restrict Zimbabwe's lead to 59. Then, Surrey colleagues Alex Stewart and Graham Thorpe, with unbeaten innings of 150 respectively, steered England to 195 for three before rain prevented any further play. So, a drawn test series, but a clean sweep for Zimbabwe and the One Day Internationals meant that England's winter programme had begun in the worst possible way. At least New Zealand provided a chance for a fresh start. But when Stephen Fleming's superb 129 led New Zealand to 390 in the first test at Auckland, England hearts must have fluttered nervously. But Mike Atherton, Stewart and Thorpe had other ideas and took England to the comfort of 521. Atherton returned to form with 83 after being woefully out of touch in Zimbabwe, whilst the Surrey pair both struck sweet centuries. A crucial last wicket stand between Danny Morrison and Centurion Nathan Astle denied England victory, but things were beginning to look more promising at last. The improvement continued at Wellington, where Goff and a recalled Andy Caddick dispatched New Zealand for 124 in their first innings, a blow from which they never recovered. Thorpe rubbed salt in the wound by scoring another accomplished 100, and then the bowlers turned the screw. Croft and Tufnell exerted a stranglehold, while Goff had a day where the luck went with him and England ran out winners by an innings. At Christchurch, Chris Cairns, Adam Perori and Fleming all made 50s in a total of 346, while Croft took his first five-wicket haul in Test cricket. Then England stuttered, with only captain Michael Atherton holding steady and carrying his bat for 94 not out. Nevertheless, a deficit of 118 put England under pressure, and they would need to bowl well to prevent the home side establishing an impregnable bridgehead. They did, and in bowling New Zealand out for 186, left the match tantalisingly poised. The combined efforts of yet again Goff, Tufnell and Croft meant that England's target was 305 in 148 overs. Obviously, no one had told Michael Atherton that England had only once in their history scored more than 300 in the fourth innings to win a test match, and he went on to score a superb 100. John Crawley and Dominic Cork made sure there was no last-minute slip-up, 
and England at last had something to smile about as they took the series 2-0. And from John Crawley, who've done a brilliant job. They really have done a marvellous job. Crawley grabs the stumps. Really spirited stuff there from England, and maybe they'd be a match for the Australians after all. Back now to the domestic season and the NatWest Trophy, the oldest of our one-day competitions. Chris Broad has the story. Although there's an occasional upset, more often than not, the first round of the NatWest Trophy emphasises the gulf between the minor and the first-class counties. Still, Darren Goff, England's premier fast bowler, clearly relished the opportunity for some glory against Ireland and duly ran through the fragile batting lineup, finishing off matters in the most emphatic way possible with a hat trick. His figures of 7 for 27 surpassed Fred Truman's 6 for 15 in 1965 as Yorkshire's best in the competition. Ireland were bowled out for just 53. Yorkshire's progress was not held up by Leicestershire in the second round. Craig White top scored with an unbeaten 96, but it was the clean hitting of Bradley Parker which took the Yorkshire innings past 300 oh, and out of Leicester's shot. reach. Parker hit three sixes and four fours in his 49 ball 69, and in 16 overs the pair added 129 for the fifth wicket. Well, that's quite a blow. It's gone right over the top of our commentary box. bother chasing that. Leicester's reply brought back memories of their debacle against Surrey in the Benson Hedges semi-final. Openers Darren Maddy and Vince Wells both made ducks. Then James Whitaker was trapped in front by a rampaging Goff, 14 for three. Darren Goff had been threatening to bring one back. Richard Stem then turned the screw with three more wickets, 75 for six and not even a courageous innings of 90 from Ian Sutcliffe could prevent a dismal Leicester defeat. In the quarter-finals, Yorkshire seemed to have done enough to win again when they reduced Glamorgan to 209 for 9 with 28 still needed. That victory should have been completed when Waka Yunus skied Richard Stem to mid-on, but Michael Vaughan spilled the catch to the joy of the home crowd and Glamorgan scraped home courtesy of a Chris Silverwood wide at the start of the final over. In the other quarter-finals, there was a mixed day for Nasser Hussein at Trent Bridge. Fresh from a valiant hundred against the Australians at Headingley, his mind seemed to be elsewhere when he dropped three routine catches in different positions as Nottinghamshire racked up a strong total of 288 for five from their 60 overs. Captain Paul Johnson led the way with 106. Then, in a fashion that was to become a feature of the competition, Stuart Law laid into the new ball. With clinical timing, he struck 11 fours in a 33 ball 49 as Knott's inexperienced attack was put to the sword. Goes up to 49. And there's another mighty hit, but it's up in the air this time. He miscued it, Paul Johnson. The joy of the home side at his dismissal was understandable as he looked to be driving Essex to victory at a canter, despite the high target. But Hussein took the opportunity to make amends for his catching and with a carefully crafted innings of 89 from 133 balls, he guided Essex to the winning post. Ashley Cowan struck the winning runs with 10 balls to spare. Wave there from Hussein, who's certainly done more than anybody with a bat. Undoubtedly, the surprise of the round came at Derby, where the home side amassed a huge total of 327 for eight against Sussex. Chris Adams' unbeaten 129 from 148 balls dominated the innings. Rajesh Rao, on his NatWest debut, then managed to put Adams' effort into the shade by smashing an amazing 158 from 165 balls to steer Sussex home by five wickets. In the other quarter-final, David Hemp's classy knock of 112 put Warwickshire in a strong position against Middlesex at Lords. Chasing 287, Middlesex slumped to 55 for three before Mark Ramprakash resurrected their hopes with a captain's innings of 98. Trevor Penny's run out of Oish Shah swung the balance and his diving catch moments later to dismiss Rampakash sealed the match.
In their semi-final, Warwickshire steamrolled Sussex. Neil Smith took advantage of some wayward new ball overs from Paul Jarvis, putting on 130 for the first wicket with Andy Moles. Well, it's carbon copies. Then Hemp and Dominic Osler up the tempo further with a stand of 142. 158 runs came off the last 19.2 overs and the Warwickshire total of 342 for three was never likely to be challenged. Alan Donald took the bowling honours with 5 for 37, bowling Bill Athey, Mark Newell and finally Peter Moores to clinch a place at Lords, Warwickshire's fourth NatWest final in five years. That's it, Donald's fifth. End of the game. The other semi-final at Chelmsford was a far closer affair. PCA Player of the Year Steve James hit 109 for Glamorgan and Tony Cotty used his experience and a certain amount of improvisation as the visitors posted a daunting total of 301. But Stuart Law was soon at it again, this time smashing 90 runs from only 73 balls. A beamer from Darren Thomas incensed Law but didn't do anything to stem the tide as in the previous round Essex seemed to be making light of an imposing target. Six runs. But having reached the apparent comfort of 280 for four and with the light worsening, Essex lost four wickets for 16 runs, including Ronnie Irani, LBW to Thomas. The unfortunate and accidental clash between batsman and the bowler seemed to ignite an already tense atmosphere and when Wacker was recalled with still only six runs needed, Mark Eilert made his thoughts plain to the umpires. Tempers flared and the ensuing altercation between Eilert and Glamorgan's Croft resulted in both players being fined £1,000 by their counties. When the game resumed the next day, Thomas immediately found the edge of Tim Hodgson's bat and Glamorgan were on the brink of a famous victory, but Peter Such stayed calm and coolly drove a full toss for four to book Essex's place at Lord's. Master of options suddenly becomes one of the most famous batsmen in Essex history. Disappointingly, the excitement of that semi-final was not recaptured in the final. Having lost the toss, Warwickshire were unsurprisingly asked to bat, and the early morning movement in the air and off the pitch left their hopes of a big score in tatters. Nick Knight went unluckily in the first over, and Ashley Cowan then found the edge of skipper Neil Smith's bat to leave Warwickshire 12 for two. Keep it going in that right slot, and he did. Warwickshire never managed a real recovery. Hemp was run out by Paul Grayson's underarm throw. Well, well, well. And he fell to another Cowan outswinger. Oh, well done. Yes, and Osler pulled a Rani high to mid-wicket, where Danny Law held on the third edge, attempt. And will be out. Well, he has. Peter Such's catch off his own bowling to send back Graham Welsh was the highlight of Essex's tenacious display in the field as they restricted the Bears to the score of 170 for eight from 60 overs. If Essex were concerned that even such a small total would be difficult to chase after the previous year's debacle, they didn't show it. Paul Pritchard gave a chance early on, but thereafter, he and Stuart Law thrashed the Warwickshire attack to all parts of the ground. Law has missed his side's defeat the previous year whilst on international duty, but his presence this time gave Essex a swagger they had lacked on that day. Well, one of them in at uh, short mid wicket. If he's going to bowl there, he's going to need him back quite a bit. Smith rotated his bowlers, but it had no effect. 24 came from the first three overs, 34 from four, and by the end of the seventh over, the scoreboard read 66 without loss. Surprisingly, Pritchard outscored his partner, which took some doing, and the 100 came up with a mighty sweep for six off Giles. Six brings up the 100. And what it does for Warwickshire, I'm not sure. It's another one. Law's undriven four off Donald was perhaps the shot of the match and when the South African eventually had Pritchard LBW for 57 from 45 balls, it was left to Nasser Hussein to accompany Law to victory. Picked that up so quickly, wonderful shot. A pull for six off Welsh was followed by a slashing square cut off Dougie Brown, but the finishing touch was supplied by Law. Not great bowling, Brown knew it. In the air. And 
it's gone all the way in the air, right over the top. And there it is, the misfield. Those innings of 80 earned him the Man of the Match award, and Essex had well and truly exercised the ghost of 1996. And Essex have done it and done it well. It's a good performance. So congratulations to Essex on erasing the pain of last year's final. And for once we saw Alan Donald on the receiving end there, the exception rather than the rule, as we'll see soon enough. Now one of the most satisfying moments of my career was leading England to victory in India, because history suggests that on their home territory they're virtually unbeatable. Great travellers though, they are not. And they started badly when they went to South Africa with the first test in Durban in January. South Africa made 235 with first use of a wicket that helped the bowlers whilst being by no means unplayable. Andrew Hudson scored 80 whilst Venkatesh Prasad took 5 for 60. India's reply was abject. No batsman facing more than 45 balls as they succumbed for just 100. That man Donald taking 5 for 40. Hudson, Adam Backer and Brian McMillan took South Africa to a total of 259 including a last wicket partnership of 74 between Macmillan and Donald, leaving the visitors a massive total of 395 to win. If that was unlikely, to say the least, they would surely bat with more fight than in the first innings. But astonishingly, they were even worse. Only Raoul Dravid salvaging a vestige of pride with 27 not out, as India subsided for a pitiful 66 all out. Sean Pollock took 3 for 25, Lance Klusner 2 for 16, and Alan Donald 4 for 14 to complete match figures of 9 for 54. Donald. South Africa ran out winners inside three days by an amazing 328 runs. If India were on the ropes, the first innings at Newlands delivered the knockout punch. Gary Kirsten, Brian McMillan and Lance Klusner all scored hundreds as South Africa amassed 529 before declaring. When India were reduced to 58 for 5, they must have thought they were destined to make another low score. But in fact, it sparked one of the great counter-attacks of all time. New captain Sachin Tendulkar and his predecessor, Mohamed Azharuddin, came together in a scintillating partnership, Tendulkar scoring 169 and Azza 115 off just 110 balls. It was truly breathtaking stuff. However, when the heartbeats had returned to normal, South Africa still had a lead of 170, and Hudson, Cullinan, Macmillan and Pollock cheerfully rattled up sufficient runs to enable Cornier to declare. This time round there was to be no reprieve, and Paul Adams helped Pollock and Donald to shoot out India for only 144, to ensure victory by 282 runs, and the series. India soured some pride at Johannesburg in the final test, although they were unable to force a victory. Dravid and Ganguly shared an excellent partnership to take the visitors to a respectable total of 410, with Dravid completing a fine 148, his maiden Test 100. Then Javagal Srinat took five wickets in the South African response, as several batsmen got going, but no one made a big score, and India secured a lead of 89. Although Rator, Mongia, Dravid and Ganguly all made runs, they seemed to lack the ambition to force the pace, and this ultimately cost them victory. South Africa looked doomed when six batsmen made only single-figure scores. But then Darrell Cullinan struck a majestic undefeated century. It's up and over the head of the backward square leg. He wasn't on the boundary. And there's more runs to come. The South Africans are playing so positively, it's quite extraordinary. And that's his 100. It was a bad ball from Tendulkar. Lance Klusner joined in with a robust 49 to leave India two wickets short of victory when rain brought an end to the and contest. this time they do offer it to the batsmen and they readily of course take it and so I would think the test match has been drawn. What an effort. Amazing stroke play there from Azza and Tendulkar and almost matched by Darrell Cullinan. 
But if it's a shot of all you want in this country, then it's the AXA Life League for you. Coloured clothing and all. Now, it might be the most derided competition in this country, but it's also the best attended. Trusty Conservatives can now press the fast-forward button, as Chris Broad takes us through the story of this year's competition. After their long-awaited success last year, Surrey were unable to sustain a challenge for a repeat performance, and Kent and Warwickshire were to dominate the 1997 AXA Life Sunday League. Surrey started well with a victory against Somerset in April and also beat Gloucestershire in May in a thriller. <laughs> Although Surrey never threatened to retain their title, they made an impact in other ways. When they travelled to Hove in August for a Sunday league match played on a Thursday evening, they must have reflected in their own brave effort to stage a match under lights, which was scuppered by torrential rain. That did not seem to hamper them in any way, and they positively blitzed their way to victory over the hapless Sussex. Put it down. Wasn't an easy chance. It ends the game, and it's come to an end in 27 and a half overs. Chris Lewis unbeaten. Then there was Ali Brown, who made the most of a flat track at Guildford to smash an astonishing 203 off just 118 balls, the highest ever individual score in the Sunday League, Massive containing 19 fours and 11 sixes, as Surrey amassed 344 in their 40 overs. Yep. Punched away for four through mid-wicket. Yep. Time beautifully. Four more. Down the track this time. And heaved high over long on for six. That's his 150. Even the man out at extra cover can't uh, get anywhere near that. And this is going to be four more. And there's another one. Well, what a great way to break the Sunday League scoring record. Through the leg side for four. 200 for Ali Brown. This really is a stunning achievement in a 40 over cricket match. Although it was a total that was never going to be overhauled, Matthew Hayden showed some of the form That's in reply that made him leading AXA run scorer this season. Indeed, the top three places were all taken by Australians, the others being Darren Lehman and Stuart Law. Law's form was largely responsible for Essex's impressive start to the season but it seemed that he needed to make a big score for Essex to win. 47 against Yorkshire at Ilford contributed to a healthy sounding total of 262, but Yorkshire romped home with overs to spare thanks to 50s from David Bias, Michael Vaughan and Darren Lehman. Lancashire, past masters at one day cricket, stayed in hot pursuit throughout. Their challenge led by the consistent batting of Jason Gallion, who averaged over 60, and the pugnacious stroke play of Graham Lloyd. My words, Mark. Even more important was the former Peter Martin, who ended up as top Sunday wicket-taker of the season. 31 wickets at 12 and a half is impressive stuff, and five of them came in defeat of Essex in September that virtually assured Lancashire of third place. But by September, the league had become a two-horse race, with Kent firmly in the driving seat. Victory against Hampshire on a day when most of the matches were abandoned seemed decisive. Tight bowling and excellent fielding to starve the opposition of runs and attacking batsmen to compile runs quickly, led by Trevor Ward, who finished as the highest scoring English Axe batsman. But at Portsmouth, it was 20-year-old Ed Smith's turn to lead Kent to a comfortable victory. Played well, this young man. Good short arm job. Played for the gap. Didn't try to hit it too hard. Yeah, I like the way he's batted. Everybody in the ring. And it goes straight away for four. And that's the win that Kent wants. And so to Headingley, with the title assured, if Kent could beat Yorkshire, missing all five frontline bowlers. Kent won the toss and batted, but Yorkshire's second string attack caused real problems. Oh, he's bowled him! Now that could be a crucial breakthrough. But the last ditch stand between Paul Strang and skipper Steve Marsh dragged away, Kent from Strang the depth of 120 to 7 to respectability of 190. Be With the wicket playing tricks, it was surely enough. 
But Kent have had major problems with finals for years, and this was to be no exception. Where their batsmen had struggled, Yorkshire played with casual fluency. Where Yorkshire's bowlers had extracted life from the pitch, Kent seemed to be in the slot. Lehman strode his luck outrageously, and Kent was swiftly sunk without trace. Over the top, Even to the extent yes, of claiming just. an early wicket caught at backward point, before the deluge engulfed them, the similarities of the Benson Hedges final were uncanny. Well, now we are just taking the Michael. So, bridesmaids once again. Kent have undoubtedly assembled a highly talented squad, but their chronic inability to win vital matches was never more apparent than in 1997. It was Warwickshire who sought to profit. They had played all season with unadulterated all-round verve. The pinch hitting of Neil Smith and the consistent form of Dominic Osler, Dougie Brown and David Hemp all contributed to solid and sometimes spectacular batting performances. Against Durham, Rain meant a revised target of 137 in 17 overs. Hemp made light of the task with 50 in just 20 balls. No, it's, in fact, it's dropped short and he's made 50 off 20 balls. So that is an extraordinary performance by David Hemp. In July, they made history by staging the first ever competitive day-night match in England. A lovely summer's evening brought 15,000 enthusiasts to Edgbaston and Warwickshire obliged in style. Anurag Singh and Neil Smith put on 100 for the first wicket and Warwickshire cruised to a total of 224. Somerset got to 41 for no wicket before slumping to 99 for 7. Peter Bowler's 50 salvaged some Somerset pride but there was never a doubt that Warwickshire celebrations would be jeopardised. Voila! The first ever AXA Life League match played at night under floodlights put on by Warwickshire County Cricket Club and in front of an audience of 15,174 people comes to a close. Then potential challenges Essex were swept aside in late August with contemptuous ease. For once Stuart Law failed and the Chelmsford faithful watched helplessly as the visitors cruised to a massive victory. But he's gone this time. You felt it was only a matter of time. Well, if that hits, so oh, that's it. End of uh, the game. But come the 14th of September, Warwickshire must have been thinking of only the silver medal as Smith and Nick Knight, returning from injury, walked out to bat against Gloucester at Edgbaston. Perhaps they had some inkling that it was to be their day when Nick Knight was reprieved after being no caught on the boundary. Called, so, uh, and no ball being called because there, Gloucester, Gloucester had too few fielders inside the circle. He's just starting out in the top class game today. There's Nick Knight, wonderful stroke. Really is a clean hit. As the news from up north filtered through, Knight completed a splendid hundred and Warwickshire relentlessly increased their stranglehold on the game and the title. 220 to defend, but no thoughts here of the NatWest drubbing. As they had all season, the Warwickshire attack were mean. The probing left arm spin of Ashley Giles and the ever reliable Dougie Brown, Graham Welsh, Gladstone Small and Neil Smith. But it was Alan Donald who was once again the jewel in the crown and the AXA bowler of the season. 30 wickets at 11, an economy rate of under four and over and plenty of those were edges. Fittingly, it was Donald who took the final wicket to prompt the scenes of wild jubilation at Edgbaston. Warwickshire were the 1997 AXA Sunday League champions. And they've won today the by the massive margin of 71 runs. And congratulations to Warwickshire both on the title and the success of that first day-night match at Edgbaston. Now, if you're a cricket lover and either English or Australian, then of course there's only one series that ever matters, and that's the Ashes. Now, for some reason, a combination maybe of bad luck, black magic, dreadful umpiring decisions, England haven't won the Ashes since 1986-7, Mike Gatting's tour of Australia. Would 1997 see a change? Well, just to show that we take a balanced view of life here at Cover Point, we've invited an Australian to guide us through the series. Q Neville Oliver. Well, I suppose as I look forward to the 1997 Ashes series, the one thing that I really fervently hoped for was competition. In 1989 and 93, the two previous tours I'd been on, 
you've really got to be keen to watch a massacre and that's really what it was. So as I left Sydney those months ago, I was just hoping that England was much more competitive and we'd enjoy some really thoroughly spirited cricket through the summer. Did we get that? My first abiding memory of the tour will be the unrelenting pressure that both the captains were under. One was winning, one was losing, and not always the same one, but forever they were under the press microscope. Mark Taylor early in the series, where his very spot in the side was being questioned by all and sundry, myself included, because of his inability to make runs over a very long period of time. It was the sort of pressure that would be unthinkable for a general that's in charge of such a good unit. But he came through that happily right throughout the summer. Well, it was tough in the start. I mean, every question that was being asked was about Mark Taylor. It wasn't only directed at Mark, it was directed at all the other players. Uh, the media just didn't think, seem concerned with any of the other players. And I felt it was distracting a little bit from their games. Uh, everything was sort of towards how Mark was going. So I think we were a bit distracted. So it was good he got 100 to sort of bury the hatchet. Yeah, I thought the counties did a good job before the test matches. They seemed to put out decent sides and make life difficult for him. And we got him out early at Edge Baston, and I think all that... Uh, hoo-ha about his position and his batting affected their team and obviously that was a positive for us. In 1989 and 1993 the one thing that I'll always remember those series for, sure there were mistakes but the exceptionally high quality of the umpiring, we certainly didn't see that in 1997. I thought the mistakes were just so manifestly poor as to throw some question on the ability of the umpires to handle cricket at this level. In a series where good batsmen struggled, the key to Australia's success in this series was their draw full of highly credentialed bowlers. To emphasise the point at Edge Baston, Gillespie broke down while Warren and McGrath had indifferent games and Australia was thrashed. After that, the bowlers performed up to expectations and decided the series. Paul Rifle's call-up because of injury to Andy Becker was a major ingredient in making Australia's attack substantially more lethal than England's. Their key bowlers were McGrath and Warne. Uh, the others bowled well at times, were fed off, off McGrath and Warne. Uh, what would have stuck in their captain's mind is that when McGrath and Warne were bowling together, the and runs dried up, and that was the, the key to, to their bowling performance. Shane Warne, the Australian star spinner, was written off by the English press too quickly. Thoughts of his death, I think, were just a little bit too premature. He came back grandly and maintained his already significant reputation, particularly in the Manchester Test, where probably for the only time in the series he had conducive conditions for his wonderful leg spin. A very simple game plan. All I seem is bang away on a length. Um, and I have Shane Warne bowling from one end to rotate the seamers from the other. Glenn McGrath, who bowled wonderfully well all summer, just is very simple bowl. It hits the length all day long uh, with the odd pretty good bouncer, um, and it was a recipe for success this summer. Glenn McGrath, the world's number one fast bowler, maintained his already high reputation. His haul of eight wickets at Lords was a significant performance after the disaster of Edgebaston, and throughout the series he would always worry England's best. Yeah, he was a bit out of sorts in the first game, but uh, we knew he was going to come good. He was just lacking a little bit of rhythm and bowling. He'd actually had six weeks off. He had three weeks off towards the end of the South African tour. He didn't play the one day. So. And for him, he's the sort of bowler who needs to bowl every day to, to get into a rhythm. So he was just a bit out of sync in that first test match, but we knew he'd come good. Jason Gillespie, the fast bowler from South Australia, while breaking down in the edge Baston test, then came back and, in fact, had such a good series before the stress fracture to his back that he's moved himself up about 30 places oh, yeah. in the world rankings and I think signified a player of enormous talent and a very big future. Well, I think we've got probably well, the best bowling attack in the world at full strength. Um, McGrath is obviously a quality bowler. Gillespie is going to go on and be a great bowler. Rifle is probably the most underrated test bowler going around. And then you've got Shane Warne. So to try and score easy runs off that attack is, is not, uh, not a thing that's easily accomplished. And uh, they're quality bowlers. So. <laughs> We, we always feel as if we're going to bowl sides out for under 300, so if you can do that, you're going to win most test matches. The England bowlers never quite matched it with the Australians through the summer. The one possible exception occasionally was Darren Goff. His first and sometimes second spell excellent. The one doubt about his longevity in test cricket seems to be his inability to bowl spells numbers three and four in a day's play. And perhaps it was the injury that was eventually to bring about the end of his summer that caused some of that early season problem. I think uh, if England get uh, the right combination, they're a top quality uh, attack. I mean, Headley bowled very well. He looks a uh, good test match bowler. He's always there, thereabouts, good length, good change of pace. Goff is a, is a class bowler. He can swing the ball both ways at good pace. And Caddick, uh, who's always impressed me, but um, I can't believe he hasn't got more of a regular spot. But I think now he's got his confidence at this level. And 
he'll kick on and be a very good test match bowler for the next couple of years. Well, Andy Caddick's got all the attributes that make a good test bowler. He's tall, he's got pace, he bowls with a high action, gets bounce, uh, and if he's going to get any shape, it's generally slightly away towards the slips. Um, so all that make for um, you know, a test class bowler, and, and when conditions are right, he ought to be an attacking, wicket taking bowler for us. And when conditions are in the batsman's favour, he ought to be able to bowl in a kind of defensive mode, hitting the splice of the bat, not going for too many runs and overs. So he should be able to be both an attacking and defensive bowler for us, and, uh, and a mainstay of our attack. Dean Headley came in and did well in helpful conditions at Old Trafford, uh, and did well thereafter when he played, apart from maybe at Headingley, where he just struggled for a bit of rhythm. But again, um, he's got pace, he's got a quicker ball which surprises batsmen. Oh dear. Um, and I think he bowls particularly well at left handers. The player with the best pedigree in uh, Test cricket in the world probably is Dean Headley, grandson of the great George, and at times through the series he bowled with brilliance. The major worry I think that Dean Headley has to overcome is the consistent falling to injury. When he can play four, five, six Test matches in a row without that problem, then he will have arrived as a terrific Test cricketer. From the England point of view, my abiding memory will be Graham Thorpe's ability to take on the Australians. He had a wonderful series with the bat. I think would be one of the few England players that would be considered for a place in the Australian side. And with the Australians' love of being taken on and sometimes beaten, there wouldn't be an Australian that wouldn't reckon that Graham Thorpe is a bloody good cricketer. Well, Graham Thorpe, uh, he always impresses. I'm very surprised he hasn't scored even more heavily at test level. He's got a very good technique, he's got all the shots and he fights hard. Um, if, if he can become just a bit more consistent, he can turn into a great player for England. I think that, that is the sort of player that England desperately needs at the moment. Someone where they can base their batting around, um, someone they can feed off at the moment. They're sort of chipping for bits and pieces, but no one's really there uh, guaranteed a spot in the batting line. So he's a man, I think, who can do that. I've always thought um, over the last three or four years that he's been our best batsman. You know, he'll be disappointed maybe not to have scored more hundreds, but I think they'll come. I think he's a fantastic player, his footwork, his timing, his quick hands. I think he's got lots of ingredients to make a top class player. He's the number two rated player in the world at the moment. And I've always felt that he's been our, potentially our best player over the last few years. Um, and I think he can, he can realise that potential over the next, next few years as well. There's an old adage in Test cricket that the opposition will always go after the captain with the most fervour. And this the Australians did against Michael Atherton through the summer of 97. Glenn McGrath continually picked up the skipper's wicket, which the Australians prized so dearly. And Michael Atherton, with just a handful of runs for the series, would not be happy with that part of his summer. This summer's been a bit of a struggle for all batsmen because facing top-class bowlers on a lot of pretty ordinary wickets, and it's been hard work. Um, but I know I'm, I'm well capable of getting the volume of runs that I've managed in the last three or four years as captain. Atherton we had a lot of respect for, and obviously he's still a very good player, but he had a, a poor series, but it's not easy on tough wickets against Glen McGrath, so um, you can't really point the finger at him. Nasser Hussain for England probably announced himself as a possible candidate for a test captaincy with a wonderful double hundred in the first test match at Edgbaston. And while sometimes the form ebbed and flowed through the series, there is no doubt that Nasser Hussain enhanced his position in the England side through the 1997 summer. Hussain had a couple of good innings, but um, has got a few technical problems that he's got to work out before he, before he gets to the West Indies, because I'm, I'm sure they'll be trying to expose those. But as a, a clean hitter of the ball, he's as good as anyone. The English off-spinner Robert Croft suffered from pretty much the same problem that Shane Warne had. The English authorities decided to prepare green seeming pitches to take the ability of Shane Warne out of the game and at the same time they removed one of their own best weapons, Robert Croft. Robert Croft undoubtedly will fight on. An excellent player, the Australians believed that he should have been playing Test cricket as far back as 1993 and I think we're still to see the best of the Glamorgan offy. I think he bowled quite well all summer. Um, the pitches weren't really particularly helpful to him, um, but I think he bowled reasonably well. I think perhaps what slightly affected him was his batting form, which was, uh, became poor through the summer. Um, they worked him out a little bit, and I think that when that happens, sometimes it can just affect your general confidence, and that's really why we decided to, to just give him a break here at the Oval. While England's cricket selectors probably had a fair summer, the omission at various stages of John Crawley and Mark Butcher was a substantial puzzlement. 
The Australians considered that Mark Butcher was rapidly coming to terms with the role as a test opener and suddenly was gone. And John Crawley, after some stout resistance, particularly in some difficult second inning situations against the Australians, was to meet the axe for the oval test. And that, I think, was the great puzzle of this summer. I thought uh, Crawley played well at times. He was unlucky to be dropped. Butcher looks like he's pretty solid. Um, and obviously Stewart's a good player. The guy I thought was unlucky was Elam. I, I think he's a, a good quality test player. He's a fighter and was, did everything that was asked of him. I think it's a strange situation. Well, he, and, he and Butcher got dropped and I thought they were their, their two best players at the time. So uh, maybe the selectors might have got that one wrong. We talk about pressure and Mike Butcher coming into the side and how he handled the negative pressure that was put on him I thought was excellent and scored good runs. And again, a young man at the top of the order against top class bowling, learning his profession, learning his trade, will be a better player and a better person for that experience. The major enhancement of reputation for Australia was Victorian opener Matthew Elliott. He came here virtually as an unknown, and as the series unfolded, probably turned out to be not only Australia's most dangerous batsman, but certainly the most consistent, the only batsman to go past 500 runs for Australia. Yeah, he played really well. Uh, he, he came over on the tour as uh, probably the most promising batsman and the, and the batsman who was most likely to succeed. And uh, that hunter was a big breakthrough for him. He played superbly that, uh, I think it was on the fourth evening. You know, it was um, overcast and the ball was doing a bit and it was a great hundred. So for him that was a major breakthrough and once he got that he, uh, he played some great cricket for the rest of the series. The other player who enhanced his reputation for Australia was Ian Healy. Thought one of the turning points in the series was the stumping that he performed in the Manchester Test. And his batting in the lower middle order always seemed to be a catalyst for an Australian revival or to drive the nail in. With the gloves, he was absolutely superb. I think if there was uh, a great moment on the tour for us, I think it was Ian Healy stumping. I think it was a, it was a freakish piece of work, which did turn the game, as I say, it was a nothing ball, a full toss down leg side. England were well and truly back in the game, and then from there it was just uh, the cards sort of tumbled our way. So that was a big dismissal. That, that's why it was such a good side, I think, because the class players tend to come through in the tough situations. The third Australian to maintain reputation on the tour was Stephen Waugh. His century in both innings at Manchester was one of the reasons that Australia went on to the front foot and eventually was to go on and win the series. 100 in the first innings was, a, was probably a serious turning innings. Uh, for the circumstances of the series, I was being one up uh, and in a good position in the match. Difficult conditions to bat on on that first day. I thought it was one of the best innings of my career, particularly as I went in the game. Not in great form, and uh, it's not not hard. It's not easy to play good innings out of form on a bad wicket. So I was really pleased with the way I played. The major disappointment in the Australian team was the star batsman Mark War. Consistently at number four, he failed through the series, and by his extremely high standards over this past five years, Mark War would go home with more than a problem in the back of his mind as to his future as a top-line Test batsman. He loves playing over here. He's always succeeded. Even in the county games, you got two big hundreds, so it wasn't as if he was hitting the, b the ball badly. Maybe England just worked out a, a bit of a chink in his armour, and they certainly bowled much more to a plan this series than any other time I've played against them, and you felt you were always under pressure going out to bat, so they'd done their homework, and uh, Mark has obviously got to have a look at some videotapes and, and find out where he went, went wrong this series, but they had him pegged, and on tough wickets, if you're out of form, it's really hard to get back into form. Obviously, we talked about them a lot. Uh, they play in different ways. Um, Mark War is a very free uh, and easy player, um, can give you a chance and Steve War is a more gritty kind of cricketer, uh, you know, runs sharp singles early on in his innings, very strong off his pads these days and anything wide outside off stumpy flays at. One of the good things about the edge basting game was that we talked about a lot of dismissals uh, for the Australian. Uh, and all those dismissals came off in a way. It's one of those funny games where every dismissal seemed to work the way we'd have planned it. Well, we had the belief that we're a very experienced test match side and uh, hopefully, well, most people recognise us as the number one side. So we were hoping it was all going to come together in that first test match, that the big atmosphere and uh, the experience was all going to come together on the day and we are going to play well. But I guess we were mistaken. We were caught off guard a little bit there as well. And uh, the England side, they got a bit of a run on from the one-day games. Their confidence was high. And once again, they outplayed us. We played poorly and they played very well. And uh, I think it was a wake-up call we needed. After that, we played some good cricket. Australia batting first were all out for 118. Really should have been out before lunch. Marvellous bowling by Goff. And the only bright spot in the Australian innings was a brilliant 47 by no lesser person than the leg spinner Shane Warne. England batted brilliantly thanks to Nasser Hussain, a double hundred for him, making 478 for nine declared. And the die was then cast.
match-winning partnership, but obviously a dominant partnership because they scored their runs at a good lick, uh, which gave us time to, to bowl Australia out, win the match in four days. Uh, but obviously the way they kept going, NASA for a big 200 and Thorpey for 140, um, basically won the match for us. The first real turning point for Australia came in the second innings at Edgebaston. In a totally lost cause, the Australians strung together more than 470 runs, reminding England that they weren't a bad team, and at the same time Mark Taylor went out to make 100 to take the heat out of the captaincy debate, and Greg Blewett was also brilliant in making 123. Well, we didn't bowl so well at him a second innings, even though he's put out a nick, he's still a good player off his legs, and we fed him a bit there. He got a kind of career-saving 100, I suppose, uh, but obviously it wasn't enough for them to save the match. It was really then just a formality for England as Stewart and Atherton carried them to victory by nine wickets at one for 119 and this was a comprehensive victory for England. Following their Texaco trophy, wins are now one up in the test match. It seemed that England could do no wrong. We got together after that test match, had a good talk, uh, a real honest assessment of each other's games and we did some hard work and uh, it paid off in the next couple of test matches. Every person was told to have a good look at their game and see how they can improve that. Uh, I think for most of us it was going into the nets and working a little bit harder and uh, being a bit more focused on the cricket. The second turning point in the tour came with England's first innings at Lords. McGrath took eight wickets, England out for substantially under 100 and coupled with the Australian fight back at Edgebaston with that innings of 470 and now an England failure with the bat, the portents of the season were already there. The that will not go down as Alex Stewart's finest moment. He's given it, that's wrapped it up. Glenn McGrath, two short, one up. And that was good enough for Andy Caddick. So Glenn McGrath has his eighth wicket. During the rain intermissions that were to follow, Australia declared at seven for 213. Matthew Elliott made his maiden test hundred. And they gave themselves an outside chance of knocking over England cheaply again, leading by 136 runs. But a terrific partnership between Butcher and Atherton of 162 runs saw the match through to a very boring and wet draw. I, I just thought the, uh, the balance of power was shifting back to us. We were getting a bit of momentum and uh, the England players were getting a few doubts, I think, particularly after getting bowled out for 77. A lot of their batsmen were thinking, well, it's, it's going to be a, another tough series. So we just felt it was shifting towards our way and we just had to keep doing the same things and we were going to get stronger. The decisive moment in the whole tour was Mark Taylor's decision to bat on the green seamer at Manchester. It had been specifically prepared to suit the England side and yet Mark Taylor showed unerring judgment to back his team's ability to score more runs and knock the opposition over for less a display of captaincy that very few people could believe or understand. That he carried the day after that surely set the Australians on the road to victory in the Ashes series. Well, looking back, I think we missed a big opportunity at Old Trafford because the pitch there was a good pitch to bowl on on the first morning. And Mark Taylor, some say bravely, some say wrongly, rightly in the end because he won the match, you know, won the toss uh, and decided to bat from our point of view. Uh, it was exactly the right thing for us because we had the perfect conditions to bowl in. Uh, I think Paul Rifle got dropped early on in that vital partnership. I put on 60 with him, so if that catch had been taken, we might have been bowled out for 200 and the whole game could have turned out differently, so catching is, is definitely the key in test matches. Ours was a seam orientated attack. Uh, we let them get slightly too many and then really messed it up batting in the first innings at Old Trafford on, on a flat pitch. And looking back, that was the key opportunity and the one which cost us the series. On the old adage that Mark Taylor believes if his side battle to make runs, the others will as well, England was dismissed for just something over 160, with Shane Warne at his lethal best taking six for 48. Well, it certainly suited his bowling. It was, um, it was wet on the first couple of those, so the, the wicket, there was grooves in the wicket, which, you know, when you get those, he's unplayable. I mean, just watching him bowl that day was, was a lot of fun because I, you, you couldn't really see how the batsmen were going to score or survive. So um, once we got Warnie bowling like that, it was, uh, the test match was ours. Australia then slumped in their second innings to 39 for three before Steve Waugh made another 100. And down in the tail, Healy, Rifle, Warne and Gillespie added support, the Australians declaring at eight for 395. England then capitulated all out for 200, the Australians winning by 268 runs to square the series at one match each. And that's it. Oh, that's out. Beautifully caught. 
Wonderful catch by Ian Healy. And that is out. Warren has got a wicket this morning. Makes him three for the innings. The Australians have won. And the Test Series is squared. The Ashes battle is alive again. And so on to the fourth Test match at Headingley, where invariably the TV replay board shows hours and hours of the glories of the Ian Botham Test of 1981. The Australians have had a good recent record there, having won in 89 and 93, and 1997 was to be no different. England invited to bat reached the relative comfort of 100 for two when Jason Gillespie struck. He took seven for 37 off 13.4 overs to reduce England all out 172. Oh, what an amazing catch. I don't believe it. Not twice in the match. I don't believe it. And John Crawley goes. It'll read caught blew it bowl Gillespie for two and England 163 for seven. Australia then started a teetering reply. They'd reached 50 for four when Thorpe dropped Elliott and then the Australians went into top gear. There's been a lot of talk about the catching. A couple of catches have gone down and that's been a, a strong part of our game. Now that deserted us for a time. Doesn't mean that a lad can't catch. I mean, it's going down as that catch that Graham Thorpe dropped. Graham Thorpe has took some stunners. Um, and he would with that, uh, withstand pressure then because of, of, of that catch against Matthew Elliott that he's, it cost us 170 runs. Well, it was a good pitch to bowl on at, at Headingley and, and obviously for Australia to get that volume of runs uh, it wasn't great. You know, we, we spilled a catch when they were 50 for four, which was, a, uh, in retrospect, a very important catch. Um, but they played well, Matthew Elliott played well, he rode his luck. You know, his 200s in the series, he was dropped three times, so that's our fault, if you like. And Ponting played very well in his first Test match appearance. Elliott went on to make 199, Ponting his maiden Test century, and the Australians got out of jail to declare at 9 for 501, and then knocked England over for 268, a comprehensive victory again for the Australians, and they now lead 2-1 in the series. Spoke at length with Bob Woolmer prior to this tour, this Australian tour, the Ashes tour, and he said you will find that they are a very, very mentally tough outfit. He said, and they were far more mentally tough than we were, that's South Africa. And I found the same uh, in this series with us. The fifth Ashes test was at Trent Bridge. Mark Taylor won the toss and as usual batted, and this was probably the best strip of the series. The Australians, 300 for three overnight, went on to make 427. This was an unusual innings from the point of view that most players got significant starts. Nobody went on to make a hundred. Yeah, I think that's that was the best thing I played in the whole series. Um, you know, they, they really uh, bowled very well coming back for three for three hundred. I think they bowled us out for about four thirty on a flat wicket. They showed a lot of character, which um, I don't think the previous two tours in England side so would have done that. We would have, we would have gone on and got six hundred. So that for me was a significant change in the way England played the game. Yeah, the first day was very flat, uh, and when they finished 300 for three, it was an uphill struggle. Um, but the boys bowled particularly well that second morning. Um, pitch just did a little bit more for some reason, the ball swung a little bit. Uh, we got ourselves back in the match. The England side replied with 313. Alex Stewart gave the Australians some problems here with 87 of just 107 deliveries. The Australian second innings was anything but brilliant until a partnership between Healy and Ponting pushed them up to a second innings total of 336, setting England an impossible 451 runs to win. Three and a half hours later, they were all out for 186, Thorpe being the shining light with 80 odd not out, but the Australians had won the test and won their fifth Ashes series on the trot. They led 3-1 with one to play. What was the ask, 400 and a lot? We had to win that game to win the Ashes. A draw was no good to us. Uh, we knew that we were playing uh, the best team in the world and we have some work to do to get up to that level. Yeah! Malcolm is gone. England are out for 186. Mark Ward took the catch off McGrath and the Ashes have been retained by Australia. And so on to the Oval for the sixth and final test in the 1997 series. Here is the true batsman's paradise. And with the English side losing Headley and Goff to injury for Martin and Malcolm, and the Australians losing Rifle and Gillespie for Kasprovich and Sean Young playing his first test. Here was the thought it would be a high scoring draw. This was not to be the case. 
For the first time in 40 years, the Oval presented a three-day result. McGrath in the England first innings, Tufnell in the Australian first innings, Kasprovich in the England second innings, picking up seven wickets. And the ECB lost more than £450,000 in the revenue of pre-sold tickets for the Sunday of this Test match, which was to be the fourth day. Yeah, we knew it was very dry, but uh, you don't expect the, the ball to go through the top of the wicket on day one. And once we saw that, even though England made 180, I think, uh, I mean, I said to quite a few players, we don't want to be chasing any more than 150 on the last day. And I think we all said when we're batting, if we get 150 in front, we're not going to have to bat again. So we really lost that game on the second day when we were bowled out for uh, 2 for 20. We should have made 300. England batted first and made 180. The Australians replied with 220. England made 163. And then, in about two and three quarter hours, the Australians were bowled out for 104 to give the England side victory by 19 runs. I think for sustained quality, um, the performance here at the Oval with Phil Tufnell uh, bowling at one end very well, and the seamers uh, really banging away at the other end, uh, bowling very tightly, not giving much away. Uh, general building of pressure with only 120 runs to play with was a, was a good performance. We played too many shots in the last innings, got too far ahead of ourselves, and I think we, uh, we tried to get the score too quickly rather than just playing it sensibly. I think Sean Young was probably the only one that played the wicket correctly, and he was four not out, so it showed that the others were probably uh, too far ahead of themselves. In the air, a dolly catch. Kasparic goes. Catch! It's in the air. It's caught. It's all over. Tufnell so dominated the game, he picked up four wickets in Australia's second innings for 11 for the match to win the Man of the Match award. The series, 3-2 to the Australians. Graham Thorpe and Glenn McGrath were adjudged men of the series. There is a life afterwards for England. 3-2 to the series. Ash is gone. But a little bit of respect and self-confidence perhaps comes late. The 1993 Australians were the team striving to go to the top. And the 1997 team is the one that finished off that plan. In fact, judges like Ian Chappell are now saying that this Australian team is one of the greatest that the country's ever had. I can't really compare 89, 93 and 97. I think uh, 89 will always be the greatest tour for me because we come over as, as big underdogs. I mean, England had guys like both them, uh, Gower, Lamb, Gatting, all these experienced players who were expected to beat us and we beat them 4-0 and I think it would have been 6-0 except for Ryan. So that was the greatest tour I've ever, ever been on. Um, 93 we dominated, we won the, the one day series 3-0 and the test 4-1. Um, so I guess out of the three tours this is probably our most disappointing result, losing all three one days and only winning the test series 3-2. So um, I wouldn't say this side's better than the other two. To compare England in 1993 and 1997, well, the England side is certainly better organised and look as though they know what they're doing and where they're going. The fact, however, suggests that they've still got a lot of work to do. You can't claim a great forward leap on the back of a series win in New Zealand between the Zimbabwe debacle and a fairly comprehensive Ashes thrashing. There was a stat prior to the Trent Bridge Test match, and I think it took in the first innings, that the first five wickets of Australia have amassed 1,482 runs, and the first five wickets of England have amassed 1,480. Two difference. Bottom five is a little bit different, so I keep that to myself. We sort of recognise that as an important factor when we played the West Indies um, about five or six years ago. We're over there, and our, our, our tail got about 60 runs for the whole series, whereas the Windies got about 300. And we sort of thought, well, if our tail can match their tail, then we're, we're, we're more than a good chance of winning the series. So from that moment on, we've given our tail enders more time in the nets and I guess more respected training sessions. Normally the tail enders come in and no one bowls to them but we get our top bowlers bowling to them and I think it's a matter of uh, showing them more respect and they'll show more respect when they get out in the, in the middle. The ongoing worry though that I have with the England system is the ability of the county system to consistently present quality England players. The major difference between England and Australia's domestic competition is everyone in Australia's six-team system strives for national selection. In England, far too many poor players with no chance of ever representing their country hold on in a mediocre system for the benefits that longevity ensures. And so we come to the end of a, another Ashes series. It was a fair tussle, even though uh, the final scoreboard will be 3-2. I suppose other people could uh, maintain that it should have been 5-1 or it might have even been closer. I think it was a good tussle between two good teams. 
The Australian side is the best in the world, and I think you could argue that uh, quite persuasively. England down the pecking order, but the fact of the matter is the summer was very competitive, and that's what the Australians wanted. That's what they came here for. They love competitive test cricket, and at various stages of every day of uh, the test matches that we saw, we saw some very, very competitive action. When these sides meet, uh, and they have done now for 120 years, when they meet again, the old magic will still be there. There is a magic about Ashes Test Cricket, and that was the magic of the summer of 97. Well, I don't think there's much doubt that Australia are entitled to call themselves world champions, but I also think England can take hope from 1997. It was a year full of memorable moments, but also some that those concerned will rather want to forget. <laughs> Now, back home again, much of the summer was spent discussing plans for the future. Lord McLaurin revealed his blueprint, raising the standard, and appeared to be encouraging radical reforms amongst the counties. But when it came to it, the counties decided to do very little. They voted for pretty much the status quo in the championship and just added a couple of new competitions from 1999. I think that's an opportunity missed. Next summer, we should have been looking at the first two-divisional county championship. But it's not to be. Anyway, there are those that would say that this year's competition was competitive enough, and it certainly went right down to the wire. Let's see how Mark Pugach viewed the summer. When Steve James and Hugh Morris walked down the steps at Taunton to open Glamorgan's second innings against Somerset, they knew they were only 11 runs away from winning the championship. Eight balls later, and the Welsh dream had come true. Glamorgan were Britannic Assurance County champions for the first time since 1969. 
Under the captaincy of Matthew Maynard, Glamorgan had fended off a stern challenge from Kent to end the season four points clear at the top. And a key ingredient to their triumph had undoubtedly been the new ball pairing of Steve Watkin with overseas recruit Wacko Yunus. Yeah, he's a brilliant bowler. I think I think he's one of the one of the steadiest bowler, one of the one of the bowler who got you can't really can't really keep him out of the game. He's brilliant. The difference I think between outside now and possibly a few years ago is the fact that we've got four or five bowlers who can take five wickets and uh, Steve Watkin and Robert Croft have shouldered most of the burden of the bowling over the last six, seven years. And now with Waka Yunus coming here, uh, Dean Koska and Darren Thomas had a fantastic season as well. I mean, I think that's the major difference. We really feel we can bowl sides out. Yeah, I think it's, we've had a great attack, the balanced attack with two spinners and three quickies and uh, to get four bowlers over 50 wickets, you know, you know that's a championship winning side. Uh, we knew that we had a bowl size out twice in the game to win matches and uh, our batters scored so quickly that we always had enough time to bowl size out and uh, in the end that's why I think uh, we won the championship. When the season kicked off, Glamorgan had a daunting set of early fixtures. We had uh, Warwickshire down here, first game, then we had to travel up to Headingley and then straight on to Canterbury and we had the by far the better of a, uh, a game here against Warwickshire. Hugh Morris batted brilliantly, uh, career best 233. Um, Steve James got 8 yard and Adrian Dell got 100. Uh, and after bowling them out for 150, we posted a sizeable total and, and then really had them on the back foot 100 for four. Um, so that was a great start for us. Unfortunately, the, the rains then came down. And up at Headingley, um, we set Yorkshire 300 and 10 from lunch onwards on a, on a wicket that was offering for the bowlers. Against Yorkshire, Steve James made 109 before being run out by Michael Vaughan. And only a burst of four wickets and 10 balls from Darren Goff prevented Glamorgan from reaching another score near 500. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was obviously, it's going to be a big year for Darren this one. He had a good winter and uh, it was going to be a big, big summer for him. So I think he was really keyed up for that game. He bowled fast and, uh, you know, it was a difficult, difficult game for us. Yorkshire struggled to 200 for nine, with Wacker Yunus taking his first wicket for his new county. Anthony McGrath, the victim. But further rain meant that another strong position went begging. But Glamorgan didn't have to wait long for their first championship win of the season. It came against Kent at Canterbury in what proved a key fixture for both sides. Yeah, I think at, the sta at that stage we knew, we knew that was going to be a tough game and we were very keen to win that. Um, I seem to remember that game, Martin McKay bowled very quickly on the first morning. I think he had me dropped early on. I managed to get about 40 odd, but that was a very good win for us. It was a win which owed much to the batting of the Glamorgan tail. Kent drew first blood with fiery spells from Martin McKay and Dean Headley. At 108 for six, Glamorgan faced their first crisis of the season. But Robert Croft and Wacker added 63 for the seventh wicket as the Kent attack lost its grip. And then Darren Thomas proved what a useful player he is with a quick far 46. I think at one stage in the first innings we had, had them 130 odd for six. Uh, things didn't quite go our way. We didn't bowl particularly well at that stage of the game. And, you know, they scored more runs than they should have done. Thomas and Steve Watkin added a further 59 for the ninth wicket. This tail end contribution helped Glamorgan post a respectable total of 279. And it was to prove decisive. Kent made only 154, but fought back in the second innings through Paul Strang, who took four for 59, and Matthew Fleming, four for 28. The damage, though, had been done in the first innings, and a target of 319 was too much. Glamorgan took the spoils and, crucially, 22 points. But Glamorgan didn't have things all their own way. Kent won their next four matches to go top of the table, hotly pursued by Middlesex, Essex and Gloucestershire. Jamie Hewitt took 5 for 59 for Middlesex against North Hans, and then Richard Johnson finished off the tail and Middlesex moved into the top three. Essex's good early season form was based on consistent batting throughout the top order and excellent bowling from Ashley Cowan and Peter Such. Ronnie Irani's second innings 100 wasn't enough to beat Yorkshire, but Paul Grayson's innings of 105 helped Essex to a comfortable 147-run win over local rival Surrey at the Oval. Graham Gooch also made 50 in that match, but his form was well below that of previous seasons, and it wasn't long before he announced his retirement from the game. But whilst one G was bowing out, two other Gs were by now fighting it out at the top of the championship table. Glamorgan and Gloucestershire had both overhauled Kent and Essex and the rest on the back of some impressive wins, and both had a star bowler to thank for their rise.
Gloucester's 164 run win over Yorkshire at Headingley was inspired by a 10 wicket haul from left arm seamer Mike Smith. Smith's consistent form throughout the season earned him an England call up for the fourth test against Australia and he was to finish the season as the leading wicket taker in the country with 83 wickets at 17.63. Yorkshire's batsman certainly had no answer to Smith's in-swing as he followed up figures of 6 for 58 in the first innings with 4 for 74 in the second. Glamorgan's spearhead was at this stage unsurprisingly Wacker Eunice, now in full cry. Lancashire was skittled for 51 at Liverpool with Wacker taking 7 for 25 and then Sussex could only muster 54 and 67 at Swansea. The Pakistani's first innings figures of 8 for 17 were his best in first class cricket. I know it's one of those days when, when the ball was swinging and it was like damp and, uh, and it was just swung and I got all the wickets. I was a bit lucky, you know, didn't get many drop and they caught all these in the slips. Wacker's performed superbly in some games. Uh, the Sussex game where he got 8 for, eight for 17, I think it was. Uh, the Lancashire game where he got 7 for 25, both career bests and both following each other in the games. Um, the following game from that was uh, down at Swansea again against Gloucester. I think this was a big turning point. Obviously, we were both up there in the championship, first and second. And we turned them over and did a 10-wicket win on them. And, and that was a big result for us and gave us the belief then to carry on for the rest of the season. In that game, Hugh Morris scored another big 100 before falling LBW to John Lewis. And then an unbeaten 76 from Tony Cotty and useful runs from Adrian Shaw allowed Maynard to declare at 400 for five. The Welsh attack, well supported by close catchers, sighed through the Gloucester batting and left arm spinner Dean Koska was proving a more than able partner for Robert Croft. Yeah, I mean, that makes, that makes a difference. I, I don't think since we had Ravi Shastri bowling at his best and Rodney Ontong, if we had two spinners who could, who could bowl in unison and bowl you know, all afternoon for us. And these two can because they are both attacking bowlers, but they also keep it under three, three and over as well. And as a captain, that's vitally important. And uh, no, it's a pleasure to have them both on the side. Kent had kept their challenge going despite an alarming lack of runs from the top order. And their first innings against Leicestershire at Canterbury was typical of their season so far. Runs came fast and furiously from Ed Smith, Dave Fulton and Trevor Ward, but at the same time wickets fell to loose strokes. When Ward was caught and bowled by Adrian Pearson, Kent found themselves in the perilous position of 126 for five. Matthew Fleming's wicket left the home side at 162 for six, but there was no sign of panic. Kent's low order had performed heroics in previous weeks with century stands for both the ninth and tenth wickets. And against Leicester, the tail would wag once more. The first half of the season at top order, they openly admitted, you know, they, they weren't scoring runs and they were struggling. But the depth of our squad and our team is that, you know, we do bet all the way down and we can score runs. And then, you know, towards the end of the season, they started scoring runs, and that made the job easier. Mark Elam made his first 100 at Canterbury, and Paul Strang 82, as the pair put on 145 for the seventh wicket. Strang had an excellent first season for Kent. Really balanced the side, he really ban balanced the, the bowling attack. Um, great attitude towards the game. Um, you know, he's, 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 a, he's a natural winner, he really wants to win, he's a great trier. Um, took vital wickets at vital times and scored some very, very useful runs. He, he was a great asset to the side. Even Strang's departure proved a full storm. Skipper Steve Marsh had already made a century against Sussex and with Elam added another 146 for the eighth wicket. Uh, Mark Elam's had an outstanding season. Uh, the cornerstone of our side, particularly from a batting point of view, uh, I think it's a tragedy that he's not involved uh, with the, with the English setup because he's uh, got a lot of attributes that would uh, you know fare well in Test cricket. So hopefully you'll get another opportunity. Elam eventually played on to young Jimmy Orman for 139, but Kent ended the second day on 498 for nine with Marsh unbeaten on 98. From such a strong position, it was a surprise when Kent lost ground to their rivals. Mike Smith was again the destroyer for Gloucester against Derbyshire at Cheltenham, and whilst his team were wrapping up an innings victory, Kent were losing. The weather had forced Kent to make two declarations, and Leicester took advantage of favourable conditions to force an unlikely six-wicket win.
Overseas recruit Australian Sean Young took the wickets of Kim Barnett and Kevin Dean with successive balls, having already scored 237 in his side's only innings. But he had to share the individual honours with Smith. The left armour finished things off by bowling Devon Malcolm to finish with match figures of 10 for 106. Gloucester were being led for the first time this year by all-rounder Mark Elaine, who himself was having an outstanding season. Against Durham, Elaine took 14 and then put on 205 with Jack Russell for the sixth wicket, scoring 165 himself as Gloucester again won by an innings. Russell made a thousand runs for the first time in 1997 and his unbeaten 103 against Durham helped take his side top of the table at the start of August. Indeed, such was the consistent form of Russell and Elaine that each would collect £4,000 as White and Mackay wicketkeeper and all-rounder of the year. But as the season reached its climax, it was Kent and Glamorgan who held their form best. Alan Wells and Matthew Fleming scored their first hundreds of the season as Kent thrashed Essex and Canterbury week. Glamorgan had a rare hiccup when they lost to Worcestershire, but was soon back to winning ways against North Hans at Abergavenny. Steve James made scores of 103 and 113 to make it three centuries in three innings. Leader in the averages for most of the season, his form earned him both the PCA and the White and Mackay Player of the Year awards. Whilst Glamorgan were completing a six-wicket win against North Hans, Kent suffered heartache at Taunton. Somerset's Simon Eccleston proved a stumbling block with scores of 123 and 94. And despite centuries from Mark Elam and Graham Cowdery, the spin of Mushtaq Ahmed and Simon Hertzberg kept Kent to 449. Agonisingly, Kent fell one run short of the 161 they needed for a last innings win. You know, Taunton, where we, we possibly needed seven off the last over and uh, we ended up tying the game. Um, and it's probably my fault, I only got two off the last ball instead of three and, you know, those eight points uh, would have probably won, well, would have won us a championship. Nevertheless, Kent's title hopes were revived by a convincing win against Gloucestershire, which effectively put Mark Elaine's side out of the race. You know, Trevor Ward then scored 160 against Gloucester, um, you know, which helped win us the game. Again, it was a crunch game. Both sides had to win and we won that game comfortably. Trevor Ward's season best, 161 not out, set up the victory, but it needed the bowlers to finish the job off. Kent were by now without Martin McCaig, but their strong squad dealt well with various injuries and England call-ups throughout the season. We've had Ben Phillips, Julian Thompson, uh, Alan, Nichols, Alan Nicholson's come in for the last few games and uh, you know, they've come in not just to fill a spot, they've actually performed admirably for us. You know, they've taken wickets and uh, that's been the great strength of our squad this season. There was an added bonus for Kent when Glamorgan failed to beat Surrey at the Oval, despite having a first innings lead of 234. Graham Thorpe was missed by Tony Cotty in the 80s and he went on to turn the match on its head with a career best 222. Surrey were eventually dismissed for 487, 253 ahead. But Glamorgan turned down the run chase and settled for a draw. Surrey weren't happy. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot has been made of that. There's been a lot of quotes afterwards uh, from the Surrey guys. Um, yeah. We were obviously in a very good position in that game, but Graham Thorpe played probably one of the best innings I've seen you know, against us. Probably the best innings we had played against us all season. And um, they probably got a few, few too many runs and we didn't feel we could get those runs on that wicket, which was turning a lot. Um, I, I was injured, Adrian Dale had a bad back and we made the decision we were going to settle for three points uh, and the draw, which in the end proved quite vital, you know. Surrey were a bit miffed because that obviously put them out of the championship race and they, they said a few things about us and about our game, which in the end probably spurred us on a bit more in those last two games, to be honest. But Glamorgan had an ace up their sleeve in the shape of Matthew Maynard, now playing his best cricket of the season. And in the last two matches against Essex and Somerset, he was a match winner. He scores so quickly when he, you know, when he goes to the wicket. We, we know we're going to see some exciting cricket, and uh, but I think this year he's played so much more responsibly than probably has done in the past. I think the last three games he played magnificently well, and got us into uh, match-winning positions, uh, and in effect, given us so much time both sides out that we've won games. Maynard made scores of 71 and 75 not out to carry his team to a seven-wicket win at Cardiff, but Kent, 12 points clear, found themselves in difficulties against Yorkshire, whose recent good form had carried them into the top three. 
Kent initially held the upper hand, having Yorkshire 137 for six. But Darren Lehman with 87 and Darren Goff with 58 ensured the leaders had a match on their hands. Mark Elam ended the resistance with three late wickets to finish with four for 62. Kent managed a first innings lead of 62, but it was in the second innings that they fell apart. Chris Silverwood followed first innings figures of 7 for 93 with five more wickets to leave Kent at 48 for 5, chasing 240 to win. It took a responsible partnership of 99 between Fleming and Elam to salvage a draw. Glamorgan now led the table by a single point. Uh, other years we'd have been um, perhaps bowled out in that situation, but this year, you know, we got to a situation where we was 40 off for 5 and we said, you know, let's try and save the game. We did. We got three points with a draw and kept us in the hunt for the championship so and also put uh, Yorkshire out the frame. And so to the last round of matches. Kent hosted Surrey at Canterbury whilst Glamorgan travelled to Taunton. It was Kent who had the best start in the heat haze, skittling Surrey for 124 with Julian Thompson taking 4 for 33. But batting was no easier for the home side who barely scraped past 200. The umpires saw enough devilry in the pitch to report it to Harry Brind. Meanwhile at Taunton, the Welsh were on top as Wackar dismissed Piran Holloway and Simon Eccleston for ducks and returned later to end the resistance of Mark Lathwell and Michael Burns. Somerset were dismissed for 252. It was now that Maynard took centre stage. His 142 was scored at quicker than a runner ball and with Hugh Morris, he took charge of the match. Uh, so when we got, went out to bat, uh, well, we just batted so positive, scored a five and a half and over for most of the time. And as I say, you, you, you score that quickly, you've got so much time to bowl the side out and you put so much pressure in your opposition that you win games. We, we lost two sessions to the weather on the Friday and uh, fortunately got quite a few runs in the, in the last session and uh, set up a, you know, so we could actually bat then on Saturday morning and, and throw the bat at the ball. Um, great to see Robert Croft smack 80 odd and Adrian Shaw came with a valuable 53 and Hugh Morris continued his knock from the, from the days before. Such was Glamorgan's dominance that Kent could only pray for rain in the West Country. But they had to concentrate on their own game, where Alex Stewart with 170 and Darren Bicknell 130 were now in full cry. Their partnership of 219 seemed to have extinguished Kent's chances, but a third day revival saw eight Surrey wickets fall for 83 runs. Dave Fulton then shepherded Kent to the brink of victory with his maiden championship 100 and Matthew Fleming supplied the final salvo. We fought hard, we, we came back this morning, you know, it could have been a situation where we completely battered out of the game and it was a case of you know, just batting for pride, but um, you know, we, we put our efforts in this morning, um, bowled them out very well and knocked off a, a good target on a wicket that perhaps you know, at the end was just starting to turn a little bit, was wearing, but uh, I thought in the end it was a good cricket wicket. But news from Taunton was not good, as Somerset's wickets tumbled to Darren Thomas. Darren Thomas then came in and, and, and got five middle order wickets for us, which was a tremendous achievement. No, we didn't really panic, and I think that, you know, until possibly the last four, three or four wickets where we needed them, we started getting inching closer to that championship title, and we probably got a bit edgy then, but uh, you know, it all went right in the end. Dean Koska's appeal was upheld and the championship was all but secure. A Welsh win at anything is always a great celebration, full of singing, full of drinking and uh, you know, we savour all those moments. And for Kent, a third runners-up spot of the season was little consolation. I'd have been more satisfied with three wins to be perfectly honest. <laughs> yeah, a lot more satisfied, even, even with a couple would have been uh, better. but. Uh, Having said that, I'm satisfied that we've competed consistently for a long period of time and that we've always been in there and, uh, you know, we've had the opportunity. But we've got to create that again and uh, take the final step. That's the challenge. Well, that's 1997 for you. I hope you've enjoyed our journeys through the highs and lows of the cricketing year. And don't forget to join us again soon on Cover Point when, as ever, we'll be bringing you the best in world cricket. For now, goodbye.